Thank you, Mark. I feel very privileged to be the 17th Triton residence. I had no idea I was the 17th. I once interviewed Lynn Cody for a job at my old uh, studio here in Vancouver. Um, I think this is me eh, that's doing that. Yeah, but let's see what happens. Okay. Um, so when I was invited here and we started discussing with Mark about uh, what would happen, I, I this. I think every residency in a certain sense is a, is a sort of performance where you're taking time aside from your ordinary life and uh, you delve in a different way within the time stream of your uh, own work. And so, and for, for me, time has always been the central object in a certain sense of my literary practice. And I, I will try to uh, convey a bit of the process that I aim to engage in uh, while I am here. The first part of the talk will last for about 45 minutes and somebody's going to have to signal when if I go over because I've been preparing this for a little bit too long. Um, so, and I thought also when I, when I look at the Green College uh, mission, which is uh, the scholar in society or the, the, the slogan, if you will, um, I also ask myself the question of the role of the writer in society and the public intellectual, the person who is orbiting around academia and coming back to it uh, at different points of bifurcation and different crossroads, and that is trying to act out and to build an intellectual practice within uh, the free world, let's say. Um, and one of the things that kept coming back to me also before, uh, before coming here, and one of the things that occurs to me every time I hear a talk, because I've been attending talks on biology, uh, policy, et cetera, everything that has come our way since uh, the three weeks of the residency, is uh, the idea that, that somehow by practicing writing in, inside this public space, I have embraced literature as a mode of knowledge, but also a way of living or a way of being. And this is what I'm going to try to expose through this uh, presentation. And um, one question that has, uh, that, that, that has presented itself today is this question, this notion actually. Before I came here I started thinking of the territory and the kind of simile between the Muskiam creation myth which involved this territory being covered with mist and then somebody giving shape, the transformer giving shape to the objects around there. And um, also the fact that uh, somehow uh, part of the funding for this place comes from Texas Instruments and that uh, microchips are also built by sublimation which is uh, the passage of a gaseous state to a solid state which I think and I think it's these bridges and these breakdowns of time that literature and metaphor allows, allows for and one of the things that has occurred to me also is the the danger which is constant in which natural language is put, especially when we're talking about theory, specialized languages, we have to recreate a meeting place within society where we can speak natural language and be understood across disciplines and across also uh, different walks of life. And that is not to say to uh, reduce public discourse to uh, opinions clashing with one another, but the idea of the care for words as a care for the world and that respecting the life of language is also respecting the life of things in a certain sense. So I prepared a little prologue and I thought that uh, the most um, likely candidate for a prologue to bridge this gap uh, between let's say uh, very specialized modes of knowledge and natural language modes of, modes of knowledge would be uh, Charles Darwin who is the author of uh, the only major influential scientific work to contain no equations and no meta language and no mathematical language. And that uh, Darwin also his books about the structure and the meanderings of life. It's in a sense, I'm talking of the origins of species because he wrote many books, but the origins of species is a book about the story of life. And um, I've been obsessed for the last few years, and this is a testimony to the life of language, with this sentence, which I've never, uh, the idea of hosts of living forms. It's a sentence which I've not been able to locate within the part of the book that I read, because I've only read this part of the book, which was a penguin great ideas, 
who always have these very uh, eloquent covers by David Pearson usually. But um, this idea of the host, and um, it's, it's something that, that, that we can see as a, a welcome, just like Mark and Green College uh, are my hosts here. But it's also a notion that, uh, co that contains the idea of a multiplicity. And it's, it's, it has something also to do, especially if you think of, uh, for example, my Catholic background, to do with a connection between something that is beyond and something that is here. And um, in a sense, this sentence kind of imprinted itself on me. And when I read that little uh, tome, and uh, those who are here for the welcoming have heard this quote because uh, Mark, uh, uh, let's say, uh, el el eloped <laughs> or, and developed eloquently on it. There's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, and this is, I think, the really juicy part of the sentence. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, from so simple a beginning. This is actually the simple beginning of this story, which is the original edition of, uh, of uh, The Origin of Species, which looks a lot like contemporary French books, actually, uh, which tend to English people to look like uh, bound galleys instead of uh, this very illustrative culture that is the culture of the uh, Anglophone book. And um, this, this idea of a host, uh, so, somehow, to me, a book is a host with an H. Eh? Don't pronounce the H's. Books contain written lives. They emerge from the life of writers, but they are they are not quite uh, alive in the sense that we would give to everyone in this room, but they are half alive. They, they lead a sort of half life, to borrow a term from, uh, from nuclear physics. Um, and they are testimonies to the movement of consciousness. So in a certain sense, they're welcomed by, by readers, transforms them, and turn into their hosts. Books are our hosts, and in turn, we are theirs. They contain multitudes. And, and what I want to talk about a bit is how a book becomes a book and how a book transforms once it is a book. As you saw, we start from this middle point, which is the original edition of The Origin of Species. We go to this little edition, which makes you uh, uh, quickly uh, absorb intellectual content and be able to talk around the dinner table. And, uh, and then we go back to the manuscript of, uh, of uh, Darwin, which is, is kind of funny because every time I, I look at it, I see a bird standing at the foot of the tree of thought. And I think you can see it. This is a little bird, like maybe a friend of Woodstock from Peanuts. And up there is the tree of thought, this dendrite-like structure. And I think what's very moving about this little fragment from uh, Notebook B on the transmutation of species, so he had not set the language quite right yet, is this little I think, which is an expression of doubt for a book also that will come to transform the world and to vibrate in such a way that it would create all kinds of excess of discourse also around it, as we know. And also all kinds of uh, precise mathematical endeavors. So this, this kind of foyer, this kind of point in time that is this book, there is a before the book, there is a time without the book, and there is a time when you delve within the book and you go and encounter again this point in time where this guy, Darwin, uh, created this space and time, which is this book. And I think this, the, the, this idea is that you have to think that behind every book, there is also a book in the making, a movement of life that is taken up again by the reader afterwards, if the reader really involves herself or himself. And in a way, I would, take, uh, I would take up the words of Dr. Seuss and say that behind everything, there is a think. And um, this is the relationship that La Mise en Livre is kind of looking at, the book as a thing, as a thing that is shaped, that is made, and a thing that was taught and that carries forward into the thought of others. Um, Darwin's I think is a sign of doubt it's an action also, it's the life of an idea put on the page, unfolding on the page, unfolding in consciousness. And I think it's also, I, I, I'm, I'm, I very strongly believe that books talk to each other 
and, and were their vessels, were their hosts in this dialogue. And it's a little bit like Descartes, uh, Cogito, I think, therefore I am, but it's just I think, and it's turned towards the world. And it's this idea of the book somehow existing on an interface, at the interface between the outer world and our inner worlds, and being able, in, in, in a sense, to topple down that wall, which is supposed to be the binary wall between the outside reality and the inside reality. And I think language as a given, as a social given, is one of, the, of our first experiences of society. It's something we discover as toddlers, etc. It's something that exists both within and without ourselves, and which we are welcomed into natural language where it's hosts, and literature is the amplification of this presence within us. It's a mode of making, knowing, and judging, to uh, borrow words from uh, Winston Auden, uh, an act of shaping what courses through us as social and linguistic beings. And books are testimonies to our moral agency. They are patterns of consciousness unfolding in time and reshaping time. The book then is host and testimony. It's an entry point and a shape unfolding in time. So for me, books are, are an accompaniment, uh, just as you would say of a piece of music. It's something that I think with, that ac accompanies my, my process of being in the world. And uh, when I think of the thing that is a book, I think through time in a certain sense. So, so this is a sentence that we can all borrow, that we can all claim as our own. And I will read you a, a text that I wrote uh, the first week of the residency and take you back in prehistory to a, a simple beginning, a simple beginning moment which to me has everything to do with the history of narrative and those endless forms most beautiful and wonderful that have been and are being evolved. So the stakes of the book, as deep as we can probe into its descent, are those of life. One anonymous, roughly tousled ancestor, leaning a hand on the face of the primordial cave, blows on a handful of manganese and barium pigments. Though he does not have the slightest idea of the periodic table, it seems he is already familiar with the experimental method. His pigment-stained hand imprints a reddish silhouette on the wall of time. The survival of his gesture was not a given. It is only reasonable 31,000 years down the road to be moved by the longevity of this human signature floating amongst a pageant of beasts, hybrids, and abstract patterns. In my view, the reddish imprint found at Chauvet owes as much to the spirit of scientific invasion, invention, element 56 and 25, as it does to the painter's touch or the writer's word. Some 26,000 years on, between the Tigris and Euphrates, the scribes of Mesopotamia tipping their reed pens, turned away from their accounting tasks to etch the hymns of Enedwana or the deeds of Gilgamesh and clay. Papyrus comes from the woven stems of the eponymous plant, which prospers around the Nile. The book, like civilization, takes its source from the course of rivers. Writing is a fluid substance, pretending to the eternity of stone. It reaches us in fragments, splinters and shards eroded by the course of the centuries and fished out of the flow of time. The Middle Ages, whose unsavory reputation endures despite all attempts at redress, have a soft spot for slaughter. Their relationship to the book is bestial. Vellum owes its name and softness to Vitellus, the calf, while parchment is born of the holocaust of ewes, sheep, kids, and lambs, their stripped flesh steeped in the acidic juice of the lime to smooth out the collagens. Literature before incunabula was redolent of animal odors. The subsequent flourishing of humanism with its long-ranging ships and explosion of vernacular publishing owes a great part of its success to the felling of Europe's forests. Pulp and paper asserted their ring. It has not ended to the silicate seam of the digital seems to be taken us back to a mineral order closer to the original cave and the procedural wiles of microprocessors do bear some family resemblance to the countable logic of cuneiform tablets. I wish to approach the book not as an object captive in the linearity of time, but as a floating access point 
and its weft, that tape of life ripe for endless splicing whose extremities unravel an unfathomable depth. Vegetal, animal, mineral, scriptural, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers. The act of writing takes us back to the first miracle, which remains contemporary. The magic capacity of consciousness through the marriage of the body and matter to project outwards and act at a distance over other minds. I like to think that the hands of every reader, when they settle over the pages of a book, are taking up the shadowy gesture of our pigment-blowing ancestor. That every time a page is turned, a subtle shade escapes from our attention and heads back towards the al all-encompassing hurt, the original vacancy that precedes the beginning of all narratives. That once upon a time, which more than the beginning of any particular story, proclaims the potentiality of all narratives. From this sentence on, anything can happen. So just to be clear, it's somebody's left hand put against a wall, you spit the pigment, and this is what creates the outline. This is one of our beginning gestures in writing. It's, it bring, brings us back to this natural, natural appropriation, if you will, of a symbolic space through drawing the contour of your own hand with a blue pen in my case. This is my left hand last week. And uh, I think this left-handed move also that's at the beginning, uh, I like the idea that it's the left hand that is, that is used, which is always the one that gets the bad press. And I must say also that when I, I learned to write, I learned to write from looking at my brother, from mimesis of my brother who was a left-hander, and I still hold my pen like I'm a left-hander with my right hand. So for me, this is an original uh, punk gesture almost. And um, so it's a method, it's an intent, it's a sign, it's a signature. And what I'm interested in exposing here, and I will go closer to the work that I am doing here afterwards, is this idea of an intuition that settles into a method. This is very much an experimental move by the cave painter doing this stuff. You know, once you have the pigment, you try different ways of applying it. And to me, writing is, a, is often about visual and verbal images that kind of layer themselves into me and into the flow of thought kind of like uh, in the bed of a river, if you will, feelings and sentences that I try to make sense of. So points of origins that become material. And in French, the word matière is, is interesting because it names both the table of contents, so the, the topic at hand, and also materiality in the sense of a rock or the pine cone I walked with all afternoon. So, and it reminds us also that fiction is a handmade thing. It's reading is the work of the hand, of the eye, of the mind. Writing is an act of making. And if we go back to the origins of uh, the Latin and Greek origins of both fiction, it, fiction comes from fingere, which where the English fingers comes from, which means, and it means fingere in ancient uh, Latin, the act of shaping. And poiesis, origins of poetry, the force that is behind poetry also means making. And often in discussions with visual art, artists, there will be, no, you do not understand the plasticity of what is going on. But to me, there is a plasticity of language which is fundamental and which is what poetry deals with. Even if what I write is prose, to me, it's a poetic endeavor. And in a, in a sense also, there's, there is something in that gesture which touches me because it's like touching the skin of the world and trying to sign the skin of time in a certain sense. You're inside this cave, protected against whatever's outside. Start telling a story, engaging in a ritual with others. And you're there, and you, your hand stays there for 31,000 years uh, after a little experimentation with pigment. And to me, this idea of touching the skin of time is kind of what we try to do when we make works of art. And something at the interface. And when I think about this once upon a time, this structural, uh, maybe you know this story. It's one of the shortest stories in the English language. You just have to put it on this thing that is a Mobius strip. It's the first page of Lost in the Funhouse by John Bart. So if you read the story, once upon a time, there was a story that began once upon a time, da, 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 da. It just goes on forever. To me, this is the wall of story. This is kind of the membrane where there is this little seed and fiction sets, 
sets back this once upon a time into perpetual motion. It's an impulse, it frames an impulse, a boundary that is set trembling, a perpetual motion fictional engine. So literature constantly picks up this thread, this thread of starting the story again. But before we reach the point from which anything can happen and the bifurcation settle, we're kind of in this space, which is, uh, this is a drawing by William Kentridge, who's a, a South African uh, artist, white, who, um, who, who uh, here has tried to picture his process and the, it's called Parcours d'Atelier, so uh, a stroll through the workshop and you can see it's six and a half minutes of sleep, insupportable weight of eyelids, cold water, distant view of a top leaving. This is kind of the space you're in before the book, uh, the book settles into its own shape. So this is this idea of approaching the book, not as an object captive of the linearity of time, but as a floating access point and its weft. One must learn to be a writer, and one must learn to follow a book to its own conclusions. So this is how, to me, the Bart image, the Mobius strip of Once Upon a Time, and the Kentridge image is about the space that the book contains, which infinitely opens within itself. In Latin, you would call it the infundibular space, a space that is bigger inside than it is outside. And the Kentridge is about the time before the book and that beginning, that you, point that you go back to again and again to start on the tree of bifurcations. So now we'll tell you about the project that I've been trying to finish for the last uh, five years or 20, depending on how you look at it. Um, it's a project called Blue Meridian, and it's a series of imaginary versions of uh, real world cities. What happened is that in 1999, I left Vancouver with a, a Eurail uh, pass, and I went all over Europe, and I started writing these stories as though they had already been read. I wanted to write stories that were kind of the ghost of stories. And I've been carrying this manuscript whose original printout is in my room uh, for 20 years now. And to me, this is normal in the process because sometimes I don't find my way back to the point where I can write the book before enough time has elapsed. And in 2014, I was uh, fortunate enough to, uh, to, to win the residency at the Quebec studio in London. They paid me to be in London, which is much too expensive for your common writer. Maybe Margaret Atwood can go when she wants. <laughs> but um, in, in London, uh, I could stay there for six months. And I realized while I was there that I, I was sleeping on the meridian, that the, the, the residency they gave me, my bed was actually sitting right on the Greenwich Meridian. And for some years, this manuscript, which used to be called the first impressions of the world, uh, I decided to call it Map Monde, which does not really have, an, an, in English it's Mapa Mundi, which is not really an equivalent, so world map, kind of boring, doesn't work. In French, Map Monde is, I, I thought it sounded good. Um, but. Um, then I was asked to do a book about my poetics and to do a book during the residency, and I decided to call it Map Monde. And so just to show you how much a book can, can, just a word can generate the idea of a book, and then this idea can turn into another book, and these books can talk to each other until the first book you were trying to make becomes another book. And so I made this, this book in English first, retranslated it back in French, um, and it's, it's a reflection about the place I come from, which, and this is the extension of the place I come from, the Lachine Canal, the first industrial canal in Canada, uh, which co connected uh, the port of Montreal to the Great Lakes and etc. and Lachine to the world. And also you have to know that the town I come from is named for China. So already this idea of a world map was well ingrained in me. But I finally found the title of the book after doing a project along the canal in 2017 with artist Douglas Coles. And one day, who does a lot of work with beeswax, actually, good friend of mine, and I saw this color swatch on his wall. And it says, Blue Mer Meridien. And this is like a fence color for like, that you can choose for your living room, or <laughs> something like that. And I thought, this is the title of the book. This is, and so I met uh, by chance through a series of happenstance contingencies, as biologists would say, uh, the title of my book. And I recognize it from this point on. I did not call my book Chocolat. 
I called it Blue Meridian <laughs> instead of Blue, blue Meridian. And for me, Blue Meridian, it names both a color, a state of being, an imaginary line drawn at midlife, that's where I'm at, espousing the planet's circumference, like the Greenwich Meridian, and wavering through the fog of time. It's what I put down in my Canada Arts Council applications. And, um, and I, it's actually not a meridian also, so I had much anguish when I came up with the title, because a meridian's like this. This is a parallel. And you'll see that my project is basically a parallel. Was very much inspired by, I realized afterwards, by this movie which I saw back at the end of the day when there were still independent cinemas all over the place in Montreal. Night Honored by Jim Jarmusch, which some of you might have seen, which is set in five world cities. There's tax cab drivers and its encounters with different people at night. Two people usually talking about misery in their life. <laughs> and uh, it's very funny. And so, and um, Jim uh, chose Los Angeles, New York, Paris, Rome, and Helsinki. And me, it's more about um, a kind of world map, so a map mount of uh, places where I've been and often where I've lived or passed through where some emotional events happen and which I've, or I've read about tons and then I go visit, in fact, for example, the apartment of Franz Kafka or stuff like that. So things that already exist in an orbit of mind, an orbit of consciousness. This is kind of the little doodles that went into the collage which you see in the, in the, in the posters for the series. On the left, you have Vancouver, then you have Montréal and Laval at the estuary of the St. Lawrence. There's the Atlantic Ocean. This was the, the darker blob on the world map. This is Europe with Prague, London, uh, Copenhagen, Cerberus, the Mount of El. And then we move to Japan, and this is the Blue Meridian in a certain sense. So this is the line I'm trying to connect metaphorically between all these, these world cities where I've been. And there's a sea. Sorry, there's a series of about uh, 10 stories that will go into it. Also, I've been working on this light last one about Tokyo and Kyoto, uh, the light train, and it's 46,000 words long. <laughs> so I'm not sure this is a collection of short stories anymore. <laughs> so, so, anyhow. And, um, and this idea of the book before the book, I've, I've, I've actually made a, a, a little book called Bleu Méridien here, which is the, the book before the book, which is my journal that I keep working in and jotting down all the research for the book. And this is an element which you'll find on the posters as well. Call it the Blue Notebook, just to make a little Wittgenstein aside. And the, the main character linking all this together is some, somebody I call the notional agent. What's a notional agent? It's a spying notion from the Second World War when they created somebody that didn't exist to create disinformation. So they would create like Mr. Jack, uh, I don't know what, like, uh, and it'd be seen in Russia, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, the moon, whatever. And uh, this guy didn't exist, but he was a character moving through the space of reality, a notional agent, and it was used as a disinformation technique. So I made the notional agent into a real person. So he's a spy who spies on nothing. He spies on, he's, he is the notion of a spy moving through the space of the book. And he keeps changing form from stories to stories for sentimental reasons or others. And he talks to a lot of people and just makes stuff up. And um, I took this notion actually from this excellent book, which is very well translated called La Realité de la Realité, which is a book on paradoxology. This, this had academic credence at the time. Uh, and it's, it's actually an excellent book. It's about different modes of communication uh, across species, etc., and also modes of being that are just uh, slightly unreal. And to me, a fictional character is that. It's a construct of words that we somehow give credence to. We give it a space and consciousness, and then suddenly Madame Bovary is there. But really, in a factual way, if you were to do a quantitative analysis of Madame Bovary, she's just a bunch of words on a page. So this interests me, these notions of a fictional ontology. What does it mean for fiction to exist? Because it does exist, and it does have an effect on reality. Even fiction needs reality as much as we need our bodies to exist. So is object of inquiry. I was on a boat in the North Sea. I was, having, I was seasick because I'm seasick on every boat I go on. And uh, I was having a conversation with some engineers that were enjoying a beer. And um, 
they come from an island, they came from a Faroe Island, and I don't know why, but everything they told me, they told me that they knew every city that existed on an island, which I thought was a beautiful poetic notion. I didn't tell them that I thought that. But I, this sentence kind of settled into me, cities are their own dream. How can we wake from the dream of cities? And this would be the idea of the notional agent, going through these spaces and seeing how somehow you can shake off whatever a city is meant to be and its external appearance to delve into its old time fre frequency, what it contains of imaginary, what is, what is the, the, the bandwidth of this city through the future and the past, and how somehow you can read that by walking through a city. So anyhow, it's a series of motifs uh, then oh, and patterns start to intersect with each other and through this I create a system and this is how things, uh, I follow these metaphors until things take shape and when it doesn't work I usually don't give up, I just let, leave it aside uh, until time is ripe for the thing. My publishers have been asking me for this book for five years. <laughs> so, and I've been asking myself for it but it just needs to be ready at some point. So. You have all these notions, the, the notion of blueness also as these, these cities each becoming the center of a stain, that's a fog that spreads around each of these points and as they coalesce into a dream space in a certain sense. A fog of time, the dream of planes, trains, hotels, walks. And to me, the pull through this has just come up with this, what um, well, the British art critic, uh, the line of beauty come out with this idea of a line crossing through all this and giving shape to these worlds which I've seen and giving shape not necessarily in a super clear narrative way but in a space between prose and poetry to each of these spaces. So I will give you an example of the method of its application. Um, for example in London uh, the first thing I thought about I like to have these very childish ideas to start with is uh, the fog basically and I decided to read this book which some of you might have read I'm sure The Cloud of Unknowing a 14th century mystical manuscript uh, mystical book which tells you about how you can know the mind of the unseeable God through the use of one syllable words <laughs> mostly that's how I would summarize up to a point the method that's proposed there's something of Beckett in there words f and, and to me this, this is what struck me upon, I actually read the book while I was seasick on a fishing vessel <laughs> in the North Sea, so I don't think this helped. But um, this notion that somehow of, a, of an unreal city caught within a cloud. And also, uh, I came upon an architect in a street corner in London and started talking uh, to him about the fog. He said, it's not actually fog, it's soot. It's all because of, uh, of the way the city, the eating system, basically. And there is fog coming off the river, but it's not a given. It's like the London fog as we know it, it's a bunch of aerial pollution. <laughs> so this notion of an artificial fog is, is the one that drove me towards all these books about clouds, basically, and to do research about, and there's a lot of fiction in England about clouds talking to people or coming and, and starting to envelop things and becoming a sort of consciousness. Uh, for example, there is this, um, this science fiction novel, very badly written by a very pretentious physicist called The Black Cloud, and, uh, which is an extraterrestrial cloud floating over the world and then the scientists save the day because they learn to talk to it and then the cloud realizes that we're sentient and we should live because he can have a chat with us. But it's the scientists that saved the day. It's very badly written, but a very compelling idea, in my opinion. Um, and so, uh, I will skip on some of these, but I was staying in this uh, old uh, place, which is sitting right on the Meridian, it used to be the biggest factory in London, it's called Beau Quarter. And uh, luckily, the Quebec has a, a studio there, a loft, which they pay for. And um, then I realized, using our modern phones, that I'm sitting right on the Greenwich Meridian. So some days when I didn't know what to do, I just decided to walk in a straight line and try to get to the, the Meridian. And what happened is that I discovered that there's a little spiral staircase in a park. 
just in front of the meridian, and you can go underneath the water and rise up onto the hill and then see London from the hill where the center of time is, because the British stole the center of time, of course. But, um, and, uh, okay, this is the bad book. And uh, so these trolls to the center of time also reminded me of another adventure, The Secret Agent by, no by Conrad, which has the same kind of, what I want to represent in this part, and I'm, I'm up to 100 pages with this chapter also, so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> but the idea is that um, somehow there's a secret society that has created an artificial fog, and the national agent is walking through this fog to shoot his Todd gun at a stone that is a kind of incarnation or concatenation of the Godhead. And that's, that's what I have in my mind as I walk through this prose and try to construct this world. And the secret agent, the wonderful idea that Conrad had is basically that somebody wants to blow up the, the observatory at Greenwich because it's the center of time and that this would be the absolute anarchist act. It's like setting the, the clock of the world off in a certain sense. Yeah, I think this is a lovely plot device and this evil anarchist, now we call them terrorists. The, he basically convinces his, his idiot brother to go and put the bomb and it ends badly for the whole family. This is a beautiful cover by Edward Gorey. So, these elements, an artificial fog, the hope of a straight line of walking through all this, finding your way towards this, a secret society of walkers, an underground parliament. Uh, I will not go into the use of the Swedenborg Society, which believes in the government of angels, which has its seat in London. And uh, one bullet from the Todd gun and the cutoff dreaming ahead of time, a kind of stone that has sunk to the bottom of the Thames, this muddy river. And I will give you one last example. Uh, I was in the town of Cerberus. Anybody familiar with this town? This is where the trains changed their gouge in Europe between Spain and France. I don't, I, now I know it's in France, but when I was there, I didn't know if it was in France or in, uh, in Spain. And of course, Cerberus is, is named for the dog that guards the gate of hell. So you kind of wonder if it's the Spanish or the French that named the town. You know? And I was, I was there waiting for a train for almost six hours, and I took a photograph of this hotel, which I had no idea uh, beforehand existed. It's famous actually in the history of architecture because it's one of the first to use concrete and to create this kind of ship-like structure. I took a black and white photograph, which I lost the negative, and then I fu last year I started doing research again. The hotel has reopened. But I wrote a story called Grand Hotel des Egaris about a hotel that's a device for forgetting, where people go and there's a sort of memory erasure procedure that goes from just sleeping there and entering into a kind of dream state. And I learned afterwards, and this had something to do with a love story, that there was a painter that did all these murals inside the hotel because he was obsessed by an opera singer that stayed there and trying to convince her of his love by doing all these murals. This hotel is now open for business. You can go there. And, it's, and I also learned later that Walter Benjamin died the next town over because he thought he was being chased by the, by, that the Nazis were coming for him. He had his little poison pill. He killed himself in a room the next town over. And apparently he had a manuscript in his, uh, in his luggage that is forever being searched for by all the lovers of this great unsmiling tinker. You cannot find a photo of Walter Benjamin with a smile, by the way. And, um, and um, what happened while I was in the town is that there was a student that passed with her homework in her hand, and I went for a swim. I had a backpack back then, you know, those days. And I was swimming in the, in the bay because I had nothing to do for eight hours but photograph the hotel and daydream about things. And she lost all her papers in the bay. And I started swimming from page to page, picking up her homework, and then giving it to her. And somehow, to me, this image of a lost Walter Benjamin manuscript and this swim recreating uh, some kind of manuscript, this goes together. And so, and the other thing that I learned 
in the end about this town is that it's one of the main places where you can see this phenomenon known as the green ray, which is something that happens on the horizon line uh, in certain latitudes where there's this green light that appears and that seems almost like an otherworldly revelation. Apparently the rooftop of this hotel is one of the best places to see it. And if you go and try to rent a room there, this is actually part of the amenities <laughs> to be able to see the, the, the green ray and stand on this edge, this membrane between reality and some kind of otherworldly uh, thing. So, oh, I was not even on the page for this. Okay. And five minutes before we launch into the talk, I will talk now about this series. Now, this series kind of takes up these principles and carries them over into a performance gesture, which will go on during the three months I am here. First of all, Mark at the, the, I don't know if it was a good idea or not. He asked me if I could produce the publicity materials for the series myself. So I sat down with Leon Lou, who's gonna be coming uh, for the third talk. And we started thinking about what we could do with these posters. There were four, four posters, one for the series, three for each of the talks. And right away I thought, why don't we do a little mise en leave with this? The term, of course, mise en leave, it might seem nebulous to, I thought I invented it, but then I found, it found its way back to me. And um, if you talk to medieval scholars or scholars of uh, the early history of printing, um, like uh, Roger Chartier or they use the term, I'm not sure it was used back then, but historians use the term uh, to mean like what the publishers and the, 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 the who were often also the bookstore uh, owners w would do to a, a classic text, for example. Like they would take a text, reprint it, and then change the punctuation and stuff like that. So change the physical shape. And for me, instead of this idea, of the, the way that typographic and print convention exert influence over the interpretation of a text. It's more an extension of a theatrical term in French, which is mise en scène. So it's to see the book as this little theater of consciousness that you manipulate both as a thing and a, a think, and that you give, you give shape to the space of consciousness, but you carry the writing over all the way into the making of the book and to the physical making of the book. No difference between form and content. You try to push writing as a force and energy into shaping the book itself. So what I'm gonna do here with the themes that were placed, place and time, friendship, literature and friendship, literature and the image, each of the posters basically that were created for the series, and uh, you can see the four of them here, the two that are coming, there's this line which I drew on a, almost a 30 feet. Uh, I don't remember, but it was very long and I had to keep on rolling it. So I drew, I drew the real length of the, the posters with this blue line. The elements are photographs, different elements taken from doodles that I made. And Leon there, the guy in the pink shirt, um, we discussed actually how much I had admiration for this layout for the WAVG Sebad book. Uh, by Peter Mendelssohn, a former pianist who now makes book covers and some of the most beautiful ones in my opinion. And uh, we created this little collage to express kind of the universe and the making of each book. And what's gonna happen is that if you come to the last talk, you'll get, a, you'll get some swag, you'll get a goodie, which is basically that each of the posters, the reverse as a text, which I've now finished, which I sent yesterday, printed on the back, which is different fragments about the topics that we're discussing here. We're gonna fold it and um, bind it with a rubber band, probably gonna need some help on this, and uh, it's gonna make it a nice 32-page booklet testifying to the time at Green College and some of the thoughts that went into the first three weeks. Xerox for cheap at, uh, at uh, the copy shop there. And, um, I did something to the guests, which uh, Al did very good at. They all did very good at it. I asked them, as part of the content, uh, oh no, I said the dirty word. The, as part of the, the propositions that will go in, into the book, I asked them, if you were a book, what book would you be? And I asked them to answer without too much forethought because it's a completely absurd question. But uh, it's kind of like this desert island record kind of thing. And so the answers we got was Sentimental Education, book with a perfect title for dark poet here, Mikael. <laughs> and this is uh, what he looks like in manuscript form. 
By the way, this book sold less than 2,000 copies uh, when it was printed. And uh, they, they lied, like the publisher lied. He added a note saying second printing, but it was just the leftover books. <laughs> Sentimental Education by Flaubert. Less than 2,000 copies sold. OK. Uh, Leon was a little boy who talks a lot. He chose this book called Where the Girls Are. You will notice that this is kind of a sausage party, as we did, say in Quebec. I've invited all guys for some reason, which, so where are the girls? OK. And uh, Stéphane, who's an illustrator, Leon's a graphic designer. That's why he has such cool clothes. And uh, Stéphane, who's an illustrator, is, um, chose Ways of Seeing by John Berger, which says would give a little bit of intellectual credence to his work for hire <laughs> and his, his métier, which is to illustrate. But these guys I've worked with for years, uh, asking them to do completely non-commercial things. And uh, we will explain that in the last uh, conference. And finally, Al, who is here and will join us in uh, less than 30 seconds, um, evoked uh, actually the idea of a book which I thought was perfect, which is this Persian manuscript, which he, um, he said he has no no exact title, specific book in mind, but the feeling that was triggered by his encounter with books he couldn't read, but, but books that were exhibited at the, uh, the Metropolitan, right, and the, at the Met, and uh, which he wanted to stay within the light of these books all afternoon. And I think this is a fitting introduction uh, for you to come up and uh, take the stage. <laughs> Too much thinking about Darwin this last few days. OK, move forward a little bit, just so we're not completely under the screen. Um, and let's just leap right in, because we've, uh, because you, I are, you, you told the truth. <laughs> you went over. Um, and, <clears throat> but I do want to start with an observation, which is that I can't imagine what it's like living in your head. Um, <laughs> whether it would be exhilarating or scary or maybe both or <laughs> alternating. <laughs> but Yeah, it's a two-speed motor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you referenced writing a lot and the writer. And in a few minutes, I'll, I'll try to get at the perspective or get some insight from you about how we can read, how we should read reading alternatives, but I want to stick with the writer part first. 20 years you said that this project has been from inception, from first thought to, to now. What was going on over those 20 years? Uh, you know, the answer that springs to mind, I'm a blue collar boy. And uh, for me, it's, it's always been like uh, literature is like a space of invention. And I, I always have this fear of not uh, being able to earn my living. And then away these projects, like they keep coming back and they keep, because I, I have to move from mission to mission in a sense and be able to create a space where I can both earn my living and my freedom as a writer. And it's, it sounds trite maybe, but uh, it's, and in a way also it's, is you have to find the, the right, it has to feel right, you know, like the, the, the way the, the text is shaped and you know it when it's not yet there. Uh, you can do it for a magazine or stuff like that, but you have to see what, what, what really will really like um, condense into a book, you know, what will sublimate into a book and uh, what is a stepping stone, you know, and, and then you have to start testing the parts together and see if it forms a planet, you know. You talked about uh, moving through the world and uh, having a certain openness, I think, to experiences, to places, to, to other books, just, I mean, a, a complete um, openness. Is that, is that sort of how you work, that, that you turn the, <laughs> the receptors on and, and let, them, let them go? There's a thing about freedom, I think. It's, uh, my routine is pretty much that I write for like a few hours in the morning and then I walk for a few hours. 
And this, this, to me, like this idea of walking through the world, I would like to be able just to walk that blue line, you know, which I drew from one end to the next and connect all these points together. And this, this idea that somehow we're thrown into this, this reality and crossing through it and that it's endlessly interesting. And sometimes it's endlessly, uh, sometimes it's light, sometimes it's dark, but there is always like this, this idea that somehow we have this gift of consciousness also, this gift of language, and this gift of the world up to a point. And even at my darkest hours, you know, I think uh, of fiction almost as a form of hope and, and a form of, um, it, uh, of existential pact, you know. It's a, it's, it's a vocation, it's the written life that somehow uh, moving always with this accompaniment of language and literature and the capacity to always take experience and take time and then make it flower in different ways inside these projects, you know, inside these books, inside these texts. To me, that's, that's the, the gift. That's the, and it took me a long time to learn how I wanted to do it, but I have enough, I think, I have enough resistance to the way I should do things. You know, it's, when, I'm, when I'm told I should do things a certain way, my first reflex is always like, there's certainly another way of thinking and shaping things that we can use with, you know, a lot of these projects also involve uh, other people. So it's about also meeting people, seeing their talent. For example, what Leon did with the compositions of the posters, that's his gift also. And to me, this is always a, um, a real happiness when you can actually, but then you have to, you have to earn their livings also. And the idea is that the space of liberty, it closes off all the time. So you have to go seek after it, you know. Let's just carry on with the image of, of you walking and I'm gonna take you and put you um, beside a river and you're walking along the river and um, a, a stone catches your eye, a pine cone yeah. that, that you referenced. All of these different things that speak to you for some reason in some way. How do you understand what, why, what sticks, sticks, and because you can't remember it all, you can't use it all. So what, where's that selection process that certain things have meaning for you and others just don't? Yeah, I wouldn't know what these are too, you know, in the sense that the, the, the things that get left, uh, left out, but somehow it's, it's, it's about also always keeping your, your consciousness, you know, like kind of sparked and alive. And this afternoon, what I did basically is that I couldn't stand like uh, taking notes anymore, <laughs> like trying to change the notes. And so I went for a walk and I, I, I willingly went and all nooks and crannies that I hadn't seen and tried to go see other buildings, you know, and see just how the light strikes them or if it, whatever was lying on the ground. And when I was picking up the pine cone, the students were coming out and then I felt, and I, was t I had started like putting them up. <laughs> so I felt a bit weird being looked at within this space, but I was, I, I was quite glad to have my pet pine cone after. But the, the, it's, it's difficult for me to, um, I don't know, it just, it's just things that interest me. And, and, and then these, you're visited by these images and you want them to have more, um, to stick within reality, to stick within this, the structure of time. And so for me, the, there's this idea of shaping whatever happened. And, uh, you know, the, the other day I was, uh, I went to North Van to an art gallery and then crossing over there, there was a guy, there's always a guy singing and playing the guitar there. And, and he, I think he was singing a Bob Dylan song, but all I could hear because I'd been thinking about Darwin was, speciation, speciation, <laughs> and I, I found it highly doubtful that this was really the, 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 the bridge of the song, you know. And so these things just keep happening and uh, it makes me, uh, I like it. <laughs> it, make, it just makes me glad, you know, in, in a sense that all these little things, are, and if you keep your eyes open, these things are happening like all the time, these little details. and. And somehow, I find them often more interesting than highly structured stories. You know, if you, we, we're so familiar with stories that it, you can just take a few elements of them 
and then set a system into motion, there will be enough recognition going on, pattern recognition, that people can move through something they think they don't understand. But to me, this is the truth about poetry, is that you really don't have to understand it. Mm. It just has to be there. You, you have know? to feel it. Yeah, as we discussed about Milton, for example, in the car. You know, it just has to do something, and sometimes it's, you know, I, I also studied literature for a long time. I know how to make a text dead, and I know how to make it, how to make it uh, also to read it and to see where it remains tender and where it remains, where are the entry points, you know, that make it still do its thing. And so you're respecting its life and you're not just setting it up as an example of something that is some kind of truth, you know, that where you're trying to get at the life of it. And sometimes for different readers, completely different things are the life of the text. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. Uh, I'm going to open it up um, in five minutes or so to questions. Do, do people have questions? Because uh, if, if there aren't going to be any, I'll, I'll just carry on. Um, okay. Um, okay, so uh, last question, sort of, well, this is a bridge, maybe, uh, between writer and reader. To what extent does the subconscious uh, play a role, if you understand that, uh, you know, in your own work? Well, I think it's all pretty much, uh, I'm very close to it, you know, in a, in a sense, because it's, I like also br bringing, I like seeing books as a kind of subconscious, you know, when I was showing, for example, the Sebald cover with the blobby elements, it becomes the subconscious of a gesture that I want to make, and by showing it to the colleague, you know, like the, the graphic designer, and I say, why don't we do something with these elements? And then he comes up with something, and then we play together with these things. So in a way, the, everything becomes a, a possibility or a palette of, of possibilities. And, and in a way, like when I, in a way, in a way, in a sense, sorry. And when I, I think of literature, I always think of, uh, and which is why I showed the hand and stuff like that, of this beginning point when there was a conflation of all genres. If you go back to the beginning, you know, like you go back to Gilgamesh, we thought like that the first uh, text ever was uh, written by some accountant in the service of uh, the Sumerian king, but they just discovered that the first author is probably uh, N.A. Duana, who's a high priestess uh, who wrote these erotic warrior poems. So uh, the past changes all the time, but there's a point in which there is, at which there is no difference between poetry, uh, philosophy, and uh, science, we call it that now, uh, and, and uh, fiction in a way. When you, look, you go back to the texts that are all broken by time, it's like you go back to the Big Bang of literature, and it's all one thing, you know? It's almost like Plato writes these dialogues, but they're theater plays at the same time, but where the ideas are characters, or you, or you find the... the and, you know, I rejoice in thinking that the first writers were accountants. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> thinking, you know, that the, no, 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 not Baudelaire, you know, not uh, some kind of a person with fancy clothes, an accountant <laughs> that, that, that gave birth to literature. I think that's great. But, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's, it says that there's no, um, it's an open region, you know, it's like, it's not that clear. But it's the unconscious of literature is also outside myself. It's about the history of this thing, which goes back to the idea that we're inhabited by language and we're shaping it. That's the job. I think that we have uh, fallen into, let, let me put it that way, the approach to the book as something um, that is separate from the rest of our lives, that we open a cover, start a book, get to a certain yeah. point, put in the, you know, the bookmark, put it down, and then resume real life. Real life, yeah. And I would think that you probably um, dispute that or, or suggest there's another way 
of of having text become more incorporated into into our lives. And I, I just want to throw something um, that I remember Alberto Mangel saying to me once, um, which which I hadn't thought of. And the minute he said it, it just made so you know such absolute clear sense, which is every book that we read is influenced by the book that we've just read before oh, it yes. yeah. and you know by the book we read after that it's that it is not this separate thing it's part of it's connected to our entire reading experience is that a notion you would buy into yeah absolutely and uh, i would say that um, you know there's this notion in french theory of uh, intertext, right? Like books talking to each other and being an infinite palimpsest of each other. And in a way, by proposing this notion of, uh, of mise en livre, it's almost like I'm saying the materiality of books talks to each other as well as the content, the thing inside, you know? The, and so it's, it's what about... What do you mean the materiality of books talk well, to each other? Well, when I make other? I make a poster based on a Sebald cover, kind of, it means, look, this book, the Sebald book, I love it for what it says also. And I love it even more because of the care that Peter Mendelssohn put in making that cover, which to me really like captures something of the universe of the book. And somehow I want to answer this gesture, which answers to a text I love. And so it's not only, it's the idea of not seeing the book just as a support, but as something that, that is uh, an extension of whatever it says, that there's a respect in things. And I think there's a great lesson there, actually, in this idea of a material culture of book as well. Like when I, the times that I teach books you know, once in a while, I always want to show the first time it came into the world. Like Faulkner, for example, the first cover of The Sound and the Fury, and you see this man wrestling with his shadow. And Already you see a time when it came out tells you something else about the book. It tells you, I'm not saying judge a book by its cover, but I'm saying recognize um, the, this, the structure of this material thing as participating in it. And, and in a way what uh, Mr. Manguel uh, says about this chain of being, it's like the chain of life of books. And books both, you know, and, I, and now, I don't know if you noticed, but a couple of years ago, all the new like art covers, American art covers, like whether it's uh, Margaret Atwood or Stephen King, all the paper got cheaper a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a real physical move, a physical transition within the universe of printing. But they sell them for more money now. And it's, it's interesting to see how all these possibilities also for this object that is the book are being closed off right now. Like paper mills, and I'm always I'm going on segways, I'm sorry. But paper mills, you know, there's only two in Quebec now that you can buy. The rest are luxury. It's all stuff you can, you want a, a sheet of paper that's another color. So there's a real reduction for the sake of reproduction and the possibilities of shaping things. And I think at this point in time with what's happening with the environment and stuff, we have to become more careful of the way we make things. And I think there's a real uh, opportunity to think about these material objects, you know, how, how disrespectful we are of them in a certain sense. Even the, the paperbacks, now Folio was a masterpiece of the pocketbook. And now they all look ugly because they're all made by bad graphic designers with computers. And they don't, the computer is, has become stronger than a lot of the people having agency in this process. So I'm not answering the question, but I think I kind of did before in the sense that there's this, I see this chain of life that Mr. Manguel was, was talking about. In, in, in a minute, don't worry. There's a I, couple. Yeah, good. Um, so I'll, now that I know that there are four or five people, then I'll just ask this as, as a last question. Uh, and again, it's based on a personal experience of mine, and it happened not far from here, but I was going to interview an artist who had tacked some um, objects uh, underneath a pier and left them there for months, and the tide came in, and, and the whole sort of notion of the project was what time and, Would do. and the change in, in those objects from being, and then she took them off of the pier and, and put them in a gallery. But when I went to talk to her, 
Because I was going to speak to an artist on a site-specific um, piece, in, installation, the minute I got out of the car, I was attuned in a way that I normally am not. I could hear the tinkling of the uh. rigging in the sailboats. I could, there was something about approaching art which opened me up to, and opened my senses up. It, and that stays in your life, it stays with you. Is that something you subscribe to in terms of the written? Yeah, it amplifies where you are, of course. If, you know, I, I go to Prague and I go visit all the dinghy apartments where Kafka lived and that strange teenage apartment with the window opening on the inside of the church. <laughs> and then you read them, you know, while you're there. And somehow it changes the whole experience of the book. I mean, every place you've dreamt of in a book that you go and meet in real life, for example, walking to the Green Ink Meridian, reading The Secret Agent, something happens, you know, there's a frequency that, mm -hmm. and somehow the experience of places and time is amplified by that. And I think literature opens you up also to the layers of time that are in a place. And you have, you have in a way, you have to be the radio, you know, you have to be to put yourself into. It's like movies, right? People right now are used to a certain kind of aesthetic, a certain kind of pace. But if you learn to watch, like, I don't know, you start watching Orson Welles and you get something, then you move into another time. You let another frequency invade you. You become the host of another fre frequency. And that widens your experience of the world. Suddenly, time is not just this, this screen in front of you. It's, it's the perspective, like the, the, the angular view opens. And sometimes just about the delicacy also of a, of a proposition. For example, this, when you arrive in this space, somehow this dispositive, this apparatus created a focus, just like our glasses help us, you know, or it, and it created a moment, it created a pocket of time, a pocket of space time that you enter and that does good to you. Sometimes can do bad also. But. All right, so I'm going to start over here, and I'm going to, I know there were uh, people over here, so uh, I'll just sweep around. Yes.